Do you have any guidelines or, or uh, hard rules for dialogue or pacing or, or structure? Yeah, but I don't have rules about it. It's really kind of a, a gut thing. You can feel when you're slow and you can feel when you need something to move along and something to happen so you're not boring, you know? I think structure's important, but I don't think there's any one structure. I think there are a lot of different um, frameworks that a really good movie can hang on. Do you feel that's generated from, the, from your plot or your theme? Do you think that? Not from theme. Structure for me will never come from theme. Okay. Uh, no, it's all story, you know? Okay. Um, and I, I overwrite. I overwrite all the time. So my first drafts are often, you know, 145 pages, and then I have to find where I've overwritten and scale it back. So is that a, like a verbosity in action and dialogue, and or everywhere. just like just way too many scenes? <laughs> way too much everything. <laughs> just way too much. Well, an embarrassment of riches is better than you know, coming up with your 80 pages and thinking. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> only three things happen. Right. Yeah, it's easier to cut. Than Do you ever to have add. other people read things, or yeah, are you a pretty good self-editor? No, I have my core two or three people who read everything before I. Your kids. Or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my four-year-old. Get in here. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy I needs was your reading. Help. <laughs> I was reading an introduction by uh, to a book by Adam Gopnik recently, and uh, he, he dedicated it to stuff. his son, who was the inspiration for the book. But in the introduction. He dedicates it to his son, and he said that uh, his one comment was, make the cool stuff happen closer together. And I thought, that's the best <laughs> note. Make the cool stuff happen closer right, together. Right. You'd see some studio head <laughs> yeah, come out, like, can you look, make the cool stuff happen a little closer together? You know what? <laughs> that's a really good note. That's easier than the sort of abstract thematic right. stuff some people hit you with Right. Sometimes. We need the arc to hit, you know, page Yeah, three. we're just feeling a little bit like... She doesn't grow enough, and where's her How vulnerability? <laughs> and you know, just make the cool stuff happen closer together. Right. Oh, that's <laughs> that's great. my new motto. What about dialogue then? Where do you start with dialogue? Let's say, for example, you've, you've been hearing this character in your head. Uh, do you pay special attention to their very first entrance, their first lines of dialogue? Do you think I that's. I tend to pay attention to that. I like doing that. It's the most, it's really fun. I have a lot of fun with introducing characters. Um, Dialogue is always kind of second nature to me. I think I've always really? done it. I've always just, my sisters when I was growing up would always tease me because I'd just be running around things in my head and occasionally they'd come out of my mouth. So we'd be sitting there in the car and just nonsense would come out. It made sense because it was in the middle of a very elaborate conversation I was having in my head between, you know, some fantasy characters, but they would just escape. <laughs> uh, do you have any other any other approaches to like when you're you know, trying to distinguish voices or... I, you know, dialogue is one of those things I wouldn't know how to tell someone. I feel like if you have a good ear and you care about it, it'll happen. And I don't know that it's something you can learn. That's what I was going to ask. Maybe it you, is. Like, I can don't... you better your ear? Can you, like, have you ever gone and re recorded re recordings or ride on the subway? And... No, I listen and remember. I write things yeah. down. Just as a matter of course. Yeah, yeah, but that's my interest, you know. I don't. I think if you're, if you're interested in it, you're probably going to be relatively good at it because it's something you love. You know, I love how people express themselves. I love how they rarely say what they're thinking. Rarely, you know. Um, and and I I love language and voices and and regionalisms. You know, I always oh, yeah. have and. I think if you don't, if you have that love of it, it'll probably come out in your work. If you don't have that love of it, then maybe you shouldn't be trying to do it. You know, maybe you should be doing something you really do love. You think that that kind of observ observationalism is is an important aspect of of being able to tell stories or create characters? Yeah, you know, but it's not everything. It's my strength, definitely, and it it can, and I I can do it. I can. Sometimes I keep myself from writing because I know I write good dialogue. I like the dialogue I write. And a page of dialogue that I like and is entertaining can mask a structural problem. You know, you can have 20 pages and you go, oh, this is good, oh, this is good, oh, this is good. And then you get to it and think, ooh, every page was entertaining, but there's something not right there. And it's much harder to find what's not right once you have those 20 charming 
pages of dialogue. So I try to wait to write the back. dialogue. I write the beginning just to, you know, like, like giving myself a little treat. I'll write dialogue, I'll write a little introduction, but then I try to wait until I have a good structure. So you know where it's going and what yeah, the next couple of, of scenes yeah. are. Until I have sort of the shape of the whole thing, because that's thing, okay. where it's hardest. Well, uh, we were talking about the, the dialogue that you write that you really enjoy. I mean, Aaron Brockovich is just full of like wonderful zingers yeah, and character, right. character through voice. Um, and the scene that you had chosen to talk about in, in detail here that's a favorite of yours is it comes kind of late in Aaron Brockovich. Aaron and Ed Masry, who's played by Albert Finney and Julia Roberts, as we know, uh, they're meeting with the, with the outside law firm that he's brought in, the, the, the big guns, mm -hmm. and she clearly feels a bit marginalized, a bit, you know, definitely feels <laughs> marginalized, expresses that. Was any of it based on, on real material? That actual scene um, wasn't based on an actual event. Okay. Um, but the, it, was, it was the same convergence of uh, people. I mean, Ed did go and hire that other firm. He couldn't handle the case himself. Mm -hmm. And um, Aaron is often greeted by, you know, ivory tower people with a certain amount of skepticism. And um, I think she doesn't mind it completely because she's really good at showing up people's prejudices to themselves. And uh, there's nobody more entertaining in a dander than Aaron. Really? You know? I like <laughs> the, re fantastic. the real Aaron. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she's great. She's always suing someone. She's just <laughs> fantastic, and, and uh, I admire her tremendously. But she's got, you know, she's got a mouth on her, and that's one of the, I think that's one of the reasons we got along as well as we do, because both are just two truck driving trench mouse, but she, uh, I, you know, it was, um, it was, for her, I think it was a long period of that kind of energy. Okay. Well, obviously, you're not going to write a long period. You yeah. need one scene. Right. And um, you need, need a scene with information. So, you know, it's, it's distilling. It's deciding right. what the forces are that are at play that, in that case, that you have to represent because it was real people and a real situation and then dramatically that you want to represent because it, it, it is what's compelling about the story. Um, so you felt like it had to, had to be there mainly for plot reasons or did, did you feel like it evolved the characters in some way as well? Well, putting it there as opposed to there uh, at, at the other lawyer's office as opposed to Ed's office obviously is gonna give Erin um, more of a sense that she's uh, the outsider right, again right. in her life. And, um, and seeing her, you know, they were used to how she does, dressed at her office, but seeing her in that buttoned up firm, you know, highlights something that she experiences in life and creates in life. Right. Um, so it just seemed like the logical way to do it. Okay. And then you married the, you know, some of the, some of the plot things that you needed to get out. I mean, one of the, right. one of the bits of, the, of that scene is her being tested on how much of the, the information she knows. I mean, did, did that spring from, from real life or, or was that also a distillation of? Yeah, those were. I mean, she, uh, was she really that, the oh, real oh, Aaron? Oh, yeah, well, that, she's dyslexic. Yeah. So she doesn't, she doesn't read stuff well and she reads it once. She's got to remember it because she has really bad dyslexia. It takes a lot of effort for Aaron to read stuff. Okay. But she has a really good memory. Okay. And I, you know. To make you, up for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you drive along with her in the car and she'd get a phone call and be able to rattle off everything about a uh, plaintiff. And um, the diseases that she listed in that were all real ones. The names were not because we couldn't use the real plaintiff's right. names because of their uh, agreement with PG&E, non-disclosure agreements. And um, she was so great though. She had, they had all had to sign non-disclosure agreements to get their settlements. So, um, I couldn't actually talk to them about the case. I could meet the plaintiffs, but we couldn't talk about the case at all. But Erin, well, what was great was that in advance of the agreement, she sat them all down and videotaped a lot of them oh, and had wow. them tell their entire story on videotape. So they had not, didn't disclose wow. anything to me, and Aaron handed me their tapes that they, that they recorded what beforehand. What a great end around. It was yeah, great, she, yeah. yeah. She, was she, she was lady. always one step ahead. Always one <laughs> step ahead. Well, so then where do you start with the dialogue in a scene like that? I mean, it, 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 it kind of ends with that yeah. amazing zinger about the, that's yeah, all you I, are, ladies. 
the whole thing, I, when I first started writing it, because I'd gotten to know Aaron very well, I felt a little, you know, more than a little, I felt very intimidated to put words in her mouth, you know? I mean, to write the character name of someone you know and respect and admire and then make up something they'd say. I didn't feel um, as entitled as you need to feel just because here's someone who actually owns this life and I'm going to appropriate it. So I struggled with it a little and then I, then I decided, okay, for, for my purposes, there are two different people. There's the real Aaron who I talk to on the phone and I hang out with and have coffee with and all that stuff. And then there's this fictional character I'm creating and she can be totally different. And I'll just have to trust that my esteem for Aaron and my genuine appreciation for all the good things she brings into the world and all the struggles that she has in the world will just come through. They just will. And I love the way she talks and I like talking the way she talks. So I'll have fun with that too. And um, it actually ended up, I think, far closer to her having made sort of a mental separation than it would have if I had tried to make it match completely, you yeah. know? It's kind of the same thing I've found with book adaptations. You know, if you're too um, loyal and too rigid about what you can and can't do, I like this book, I don't want to change it, I don't want to mess it up, then you can actually end up losing the essence of the book. Whereas right. if you decide that your love of the essence of the book is going to come through even if you have to make a change, I've found that it ends up be feeling like a truer adaptation. Did you ever actually run into trouble with, with the real Aaron in, in anything that you had her say? I mean there was one line in it. Um, in the first draft, there was a line when she was in the office and somebody walked by and said, Aaron, for God's sake, I can see your panties when she had on a really short skirt. And, she's, and the character said, liar, I'm not wearing any. And it was, it was just a little thing. It ended up not being in the movie, but she called up and she loved the script and she said, by the way, I always wear panties. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but she would have been happy with it staying in. Oh, she was a good spirit about it. Did your Oscar nomination change your career at all? I mean, were you I'm able to command sure more money or get more access or get better projects yeah, made? Yeah, or? it helps. Of course it helps. And, you know, if you continue doing good work, your price goes up, right? And right. Um, I don't know what it would have gone up to had I not been nominated. Right. Um, but more importantly, like the projects, did you feel like you had better access or, or that you had more power or... Yeah, you, and what, what's, what's really nice is that you get to... If people whose work I admire like my work, then that means I get to work with them. Mm. And that's, that's one of the best things about this business. You get to work with the coolest people. I mean, really interesting people, asking interesting questions, um, who, are, who are inspiring to be around. I mean, that's, that's, I would take working with interesting people over pay raise. My agent will kill me for saying that, you know, <laughs> uh, any day. I mean, he or just, she just wants you to be happy. Just wants you to be happy. Deep down. <laughs> Um, no, that's, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's the real payoff is that you get to work with really great people. Did you have aspirations to direct early on? I directed an episode of Party of Five okay. and that's actually kind of why I went back for a third year because I thought I'd kind of, it felt like I'd kind of done it. But then I thought, well, I could go back for a third year and direct an episode and see how that feels. And I really liked it. But then I wrote a script, I wrote an original uh, for Sony and by the end of it, I thought, ugh, I don't want to, I just don't want to change it for someone else, <laughs> you know? It has ideas in it that are mine, that are kind of subtle, and it asks questions that another filmmaker might not be interested in at all, and I'm just not in the mood to take out my questions and inject theirs into this story, which right. is, and, and to direct it, you have to care about what you're doing. And I, I, you know, sometimes what happens is you get a director on, who's interested in the exact same things you're interested in. And that's great, that's but magic, I just, yeah. this one just felt a little delicate. And what, which, which script was that? It's called Catch and Release. Catch and Release. So yeah. then when, when Aaron Brockovich happens, you get the Oscar nomination. Uh -huh. What I was coming back to oh. then is, did, did your idea about directing, did that seem to get affected at all by the fact that you now had more stature, had this You know, I really award? wasn't 
in a life place to do it then because I had a one and a half year old and was pregnant with another one. But did so, it occur to you? Did you yeah, think? Yeah, well, it had always I, occurred oh, to I me actually, ever this... since I, I, you know, I never, honestly, it doesn't occur to me that I'm not going to be able to do things. And um, so I didn't think, oh, this will give me the boost I need to do that because it didn't occur to me that I wouldn't Regardless. have that. Because... Yeah. You really, you know, people say that writers are the most um, powerless people around, but I think it's just, you know, you can get fired, and you do get fired, and that sucks, and it hurts every time, and blah, you know, there's that. But you're the writers are the only people who don't need someone else's permission to work. You know, everyone else needs someone else to say, "Will you direct this movie?" Will you produce this movie? Will you act in this movie? But the writer is the only person who can generate their own work. Mm. And so I figured, okay, if I want to direct, it just means that I have to write a good script right. that someone wants to make. And I say, okay, but then I'll direct it. You'll find, if they're interested enough in the script, they'll find someone who's willing to take a chance on me, you know? Yeah. Um, so it just, it just didn't occur to me. It just means that I had to write a good script. How do things change when, uh, a, like, a, a really powerful pr producer or director comes on, on board? Or even not necessarily power, but someone with a, a sensibility like Soderbergh, for example. I didn't write that much with Steven. Okay. Because Steven came on, and then Julia came on, and then Julia wanted somebody else to do her production rewriting. So I did a little work with Steven on it, and then once Julia came on, I was excused, and her guy came on and did some work. So I haven't worked much with Steven. He seems great. He made a beautiful movie. He made exactly the movie I thought and hoped it would be. And you need somebody who's got a big mind and a, and a powerful vision to get 150 people or you know 100 people to make the same movie. It needs to be somebody with that much conviction in those big ideas. So, God willing, you get a director with um, strong ideas. Strong well, have you, have you had an experience where you've had a, a, that director or, or actor or producer come on that you actually did have some substantial interaction yeah. that actually affected your writing of the script? I had a great time working with Curtis Hansen on Inner Shoes. Inner Shoes. And there, was, um, there were a couple of <laughs> there are a few logic things that, you know, somebody points out in your script, well, if, if they're not in the house that they grew up in, then how did the letters end up in the desk? Would the letters have stayed? You know, he, he's really, he wants to make sure everything in the script makes sense. And he'd bring up these things and I'd think, oh. <laughs> Don't make me do <laughs> Shit. I didn't think what would happen to the letters in the desk when they moved out of the house they lived in as children. I wasn't thinking about that. But Curtis thinks about everything. And he would always say, no, Susanna, this is a good thing. Every time I had a problem that I realized, oh, I've, I've made a logic mistake, he'd say, no, this is a good thing. And he always reasoning? sees it as an opportunity to find something new. And that's actually, I, I hear that voice in my head, because whenever you hit a wall, if you can have somebody in your life who said, ah, oh, this wall is a good thing, part of you will believe it and realize that, that the journey around the wall will actually be probably really worthwhile and mm. interesting. You have to have real faith in yourself for that. Yeah. Well, or you have to have somebody who has There's someone faith telling in you. you. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah. you can buy it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, you you mentioned that one experience with uh, Julia having uh -huh. bring her own person on. Does that come? Does that happen a lot? I mean, that's the only time that's happened. Have it's you had funny. other experiences? Say, I mean, Sandra Bullock when that's she great. came on Twenty Eight Days. Did you have much interaction with her? Yeah. Does having a have a major acting personality come on? I mean, do you end up tweaking stuff on the, their requests? She didn't or? really. No, she didn't really mess with the script. I mean, I think she liked it and understood it, and I think she did a really good job with it. Um, I'm trying to think if... What if you're dealing with someone like Shirley? I, or? Oh, she was great. There were a couple of things that Shirley... There was one line she didn't quite buy, and, you know, she's a smart woman. If she doesn't buy it, there's probably another way of saying it, you know? But, you know, she's, she's amazing, that woman. She... I had the opportunity to watch her rehearse, and and watching somebody that experienced rehearse is really amazing because she had a way of um, trying trying out an adjustment, and and seeming fully committed to it, but also 
having an eye on it from the outside. And so she would finish the read of it and go, oh yeah, that one was, you know, she really is, uh, you know, that one was a little more this way or a little more that way. She's very, really it just feels like such a finely tuned uh, instrument as an actor. Yeah. Really amazing to watch. When you came on to uh, In Her Shoes, what, how, where do you start with an adaptation like that? To be honest with that one, I didn't intellectualize it too much. I finished the book and I thought, I like that book. And I went and talked to them about it and I wasn't sure I was gonna do it when I went in. And then something in the conversation clarified itself. And I thought, oh, I know what this is. I know how to do this. And then I, I just, I don't think about it too much after that because I don't, I don't know what, how that helps, thinking why I'm doing something and right. why I wanna do something. And I don't want it to get too you know, conscious brain because I never, I don't think I write very well from that place. Well, then, do you do much organization then? I mean, particularly on an adaptation. I mean, you you, you talked earlier about you know breaking out the stuff that doesn't need to be there and not staying too close to the to the author, kind of making it a separate entity. Yeah, yeah. I oh, mean, you definitely have to organize the structure of the thing. Where do but you in start terms with something of like, like that? Oh, you, you um, like write down the pull out the scenes that have to be there, or do you? There are the three characters. And they all had a, a, a journey, you know, a movement. And so I sort of, I mean, I do kind of color coding things. And I, I did for this one. You mean with cards? Or? No, in the book, in the galley, okay. you know, one person was one color. And you'd sort of flip through and feel where things were a little heavy. There was a, a big chunk of Maggie stuff, Cameron Diaz's stuff in the middle of it, that I ended up taking out. Okay. Um, but there was, there was something, there was a whole period where she goes to uh, Princeton and lives at Princeton in the library and uh, and goes through a lot of important things and ends up auditing classes. And it's during the course of that that she realizes she might actually not be stupid. Huh. Um, and I knew, that, I knew that she had to, that character at some point had to realize that she might not be stupid. She might actually be smart underneath all that. Um, and might have something other than her looks to get her through life. And, uh, but I couldn't possibly do that huge chunk. So I just ended up creating one character at the old folks' home for her to interact with. Oh, right, I could okay. Give her that. So that was invented. That wasn't Yeah, that, that, that was a substitute the... for a big chunk that was okay. in the middle of the book. Uh, it was a great invention. Yeah, he's so good. There's one scene where um, she opens up a book and the bounce of the light hits her face and it, it looks like it's a lighting change, but oh, it's actually wow. just the bounce off the book. It's so beautiful. It's I'll just have to watch great. That again. Just yeah. as just as she opens up the book of poetry, her face just brightens oh, that's up. Great. That's great. What was the most challenging aspect of adapting in her shoes? What was the hardest thing to break on that one? You know, the book has long chunks of internal monologue that tell you um, what the characters are thinking and feeling. It's the same thing. It's the same thing in any script, you know, dramatizing action, physicalizing feelings, you know, finding um, finding action that will stand for emotional growth or challenge or whatever, you know. Right. I guess that was the hardest part, and and it, you know, it. I was conscious that it could have gotten maudlin. Mm. And I don't think it ended up that way. I mean, it's emotional, but I don't think it, any of it is unearned emotion. So I was conscious of not wanting it to be melodramatic, you know. Can you think of an example of when you, when, how you were able to do that, distill like an interior monologue into a, a, a physical piece of action on the page? Well, that whole chunk in Princeton was an internal monologue. Also, Shirley MacLaine's character, the grandmother, um, her whole backstory is told uh, internally. And so finding a reason for her and need to express that to someone else and say it out loud to someone else. You mean what her uh, secret was? Uh, yeah, was. yeah. And um, Shirley was very challenging, not in a bad way, but had a lot of questions about the idea of guilt. Um, and guilt in and of itself is not, it's, it's not a... Um, actionable feeling, you know? So there had to be something else. And the character carried a lot of guilt around in the book. So finding something else um, to motivate her 
beyond guilt was important, you know, wanting to mother again, you know, wanting to do it right. That's something you can write and you can play. You can't really write guilt, you know? I, I don't... Well, you could have her saying it, but then it's just clunky. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's part of the fabric of her life, but it's not something that will... I don't... For me, it's a lot easier to say, this girl represents another chance at her to, to do it right this time and to not be... not do all the things she did wrong with her. She feels she did wrong with her daughter. Right. Um, then, then I feel like I know how to write that. If I just say, well, this character feels guilty, it feels unmotivated. I, 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 right. Sure, she does. That doesn't tell me what she wants to do, though. Right, you know? and then you can't write the dialogue because yeah, you, I mean, you have nothing to hook it on. Yeah, it's, it's sort of basic acting things. You know, what do you want? Oh, interesting. Not what do you feel, but what do you want? I mean, what do you want is easy to, to act, you know? I mean, it's not easy. It's, it's, it gives you a reason for making decisions. So instead um, of, I feel guilty, well, as you're feeling guilty, what does that make you want to do? Yeah, or what In is this it? case, yeah, it yeah. makes you want to mother this, your granddaughter who you... Right, right. So there was a certain amount of discussion with Shirley about that, but, but her guilt was huge in the book and in a way that made sense in the book, but I didn't know how to make that into something that would move in, in a story. Right, you know? but you found a way to do it. That's yeah, and, and never abandoning the guilt. It's right. just, I needed something else to be my engine. Did you have any contact with the author? Mm-hmm, yeah. I, do you I, generally do that or...? Well... I'm I mean, in the cases only, when you can. E.B. White is dead. Yeah, so. right. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was the first one I had adapted. So I had lunch with her, and she's a lovely woman. And I said, I hadn't started at the time. And I said, I hope you don't mind if I call. And she said, No, not at all. And I said, I hope you don't mind if I don't call. And she said, No, not at all. And I didn't call. So it just. Oh, okay. So you, you didn't know. really have any interaction. No. Uh -uh. Did you have a reason for, for not? Well, just I just thought, you? you know, the book exists and. And I'm not going to change the book, but you have to... I, I don't think I could get through a whole script if there weren't something of my own that I wanted to add to it or contribute okay. to it, or, or there weren't something I felt was worth saying that I could use this as a venue uh, to say it. And I think if you think, well, that's the real author, I'm just sort of, I, you, I need to own something, right. even if it's an illusion, you know? I think, I think in a way, when you're adapting a novel, if you're doing a fairly faithful adaptation of it, you're more of a midwife than a, a, a mother, you know? Yeah. Um, but during the time you're working on it, it's yours. Right. It has to be yours, or, or for me, it has to be mine, or what am I doing? You well, that, uh, that brings up a good question then about Char adapting something like Charlotte's Web, which is not only iconic as the book, but as this beloved movie that yeah, everyone I, sees every year. I had I mean, never what seen do you the bring movie. Your... Uh, I, had, I did kidding. end up seeing I had never seen the movie. I had this sort of Amish background with no children. Uh, not really <laughs> Amish, but I had no movies or anything growing up. I just wasn't something... That's why I, once I actually got my own money, why that's probably why oh, I became right. so you addicted to it. With, uh, but yeah. I didn't see any of those kids' movies. I never saw any of the Disney movies or any of those kid things. So I'd never seen Charlotte's Web, the okay. movie. And when I saw it, it actually wasn't anything that I loved about the book. I mean, hmm. I see why people love it, but it didn't have what I thought was so great about the book. You know, it, it was a different thing. So you were able to find a way to bring yeah. something for yourself to it. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, and I'm so, I mean, I, who doesn't love that book? I love that book. I remember um, being in second grade, my Mrs. Buck Walter reading it and started bawling at yeah. the end. And I remember that was my first experience thinking, wow, she's really moved by that. I mean, I'm, I didn't uh -huh. hear it like that. Right, you know, I wouldn't have right. known how to say that, but. But yeah, that's Mrs. Buckwalter's intense... crying. Yeah, that's right. What it was. <laughs> right. What the hell's the matter with her? <laughs> she divorced her. Grown-ups are weird. Yeah. Um, so that one, I wanted to be very faithful, obviously. Um, to it doesn't have a very dynamic opening, though. So really, one it's been thing, so long since I read it. What? It opens with Fern grabbing the axe from her father, saying, "What are you going to do?" Okay. But. Uh, E.B. White's letters and notes and everything are all at Cornell. And they have uh, all his other possible introductions to it. No kidding. And one way he was thinking of introducing it was uh, with a storm. I guess it's actually handwritten 
in the margin of one of his drafts. Wow. And so I'm not going to remember it verbatim, but uh, it says something like uh, a rainstorm. Oh, it's I, I hate to even, it's something like 11 piglets, 10 teats, one must die or something like, but there's mention wow. of a storm, you yeah, know, right. and, and, and so, well, starting a movie with a storm and a barn and a it's pretty house, dramatic. it's great. And yeah. that's, so it felt that, you know, the fact that it came from his idea space felt okay. And that's the way you went with it? I mean, is yeah. that how you opened yeah, it? Yeah, that's uh, how we opened it. And, uh, and then I also um, just, uh, I thought it would be good to have a dog in the house because you're so much in Wilbur's perspective in that family that to have another animal that size, and E.B. White had a dog whom he wrote about a great deal named Fred. It was a dachshund, I think. Huh. Um, and so I thought, well, dogs were important to him, so it's okay to put a family dog in there. Um, and nothing's anthropomorphized too much or anything until you get with Fern, you know, so we, it wasn't like we created a wacky dog that was out of the spirit. Right. You know, when, when Fern is there with the animals, then they interact as they do in the book. But, you know, the rules of the animals speaking and not speaking isn't clear in the book. And you don't notice because it's a book, but in a movie, you kind of do need to know what those rules are. Where the boundaries are. Yeah, yeah and, and it, it's a little bit unclear. So there were some areas where we just need to say, okay, she can hear them. She can understand them. Does she really understand? Does she imagine she understands? You know, those logic things that right. you don't question when you're reading the book. Right. We sort of had to wrestle with a little bit. 